I'm in Isaiah chapter 6. And in this chapter, Isaiah is explaining what happened when he told the Lord he would be the one to go out and preach this negative message for him. So Isaiah 6 seems to take place before the first five chapters, it seems like. It's Isaiah going back and uh, recounting what happened. And he's talking about King Uzziah. And King Uzziah is one of the kings that was reigning during the times that Isaiah was prophesying. Isaiah 6, 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So King Uzziah. Remember back in Second Chronicles 26, read about it in verses 16 through 23, the, this king, Uzziah, he's the one that stepped out of bounds and tried to go into the temple and burn incense. And that's something he wasn't supposed to do. That was a big problem because only the priests, the sons of Aaron, were supposed to do that. So he ends up getting leprosy because of it. And he was a leper until the day of his death. That being said, overall, Uzziah was a, a great guy. He was a good king. But he messed up, as they all do. But that let, let that remind you that you may have a really important job as king, but you can't do it all. You may have a really great gift that God's given you, but he's not giving you every gift. He's not giving you every thing to do. There's stuff only other people can do. So learn to accept that. But this King Uzziah, that's who he is. That's what happened to him. And Isaiah said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah saw the Lord. This experience is similar to John's experience in Revelation chapter 4. He gets to see the Lord Jesus Christ. He could, he could say just as good as anybody you know, that common saying, now that's something you don't see every day. And immediately, Bible skeptics from around everywhere will say, well, you see, the Bible's got contradictions. It says, Isaiah saw the Lord. And then they'll take you to John 1, 18, where it says, no man has seen God at any time. But yet here it says in Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah saw the Lord. You know why this is? It's because Jesus Christ is God, and you can see Jesus Christ. Yeah, sure, John 1, 18 says no man has seen God at any time. But in John 14, 9, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So if you've seen Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. This is proof of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody's seen the Father but they've seen Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. In John 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, you can't explain it. We can't explain it 100% right, because our minds ain't that great. But consider how you have never seen your own soul, Nobody's seen your soul. Your soul is you, but nobody's seen it. We've seen you, though, because we've seen your body. Your body is also you. Uh, that's the closest I can get to explaining it. No man's seen God at any time, but they've seen Jesus Christ. If you've seen Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. So Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, and that's King Jesus. He's seen King Jesus Christ on the throne. 1 Timothy 6.15 calls him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Isaiah 6, one In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, down here, when the Lord was down here, walking in the flesh, the Lord was lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness lifted up. John 3.14 But in eternity, he's lifted up on a throne. And in the millennium, he's lifted up on a throne in Jerusalem. He is high and lifted up. He's the high and lofty one, Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. So he's high and lifted up. 
He's at his rightful place on the throne in heaven. In the millennium, he's going to be on his rightful place on a throne. Isaiah said, and his train filled the temple. The train is something that flows out. And like, you know, you see a train, it's got all this stuff coming behind it. You look at the Lord up there in eternity in the third heaven. And he's going to have all that host of heaven flowing out that are praising him, flowing out like a train. Just like the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon with a very great train in 1 Kings 10.2. And Solomon is a picture of Jesus Christ reigning in the millennium. And his train could also be his long flowing robe stretched out over the sea of glass looking very royal and majestic. Just picture it. His train filled the temple. So there's a temple up there in the third heaven. And his temple down here is me and you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and ye are not your own? You see, he's on the, t he's on the throne up there in the temple in the third heaven. He, he's going to be on a throne down here in the millennium. Right now, he wants to be on the throne of your heart in his temple on earth right now in you. But now in verse 2, we see what's standing above the throne. In Isaiah 6, 2, above the throne, it says, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. So each seraphim has six wings. And twain means two. So he has two wings covering his face, two more covering his feet, and two more to fly. And I got to thinking about this. You think about the Bible. You lay it out flat. It kind of looks like wings. And you need to put your face in it. You need to be like the seraphim. Cover your face with the book. You know, like Danny always says, uh, get, get off Facebook and get your nose in the book. You know, they got two covering their feet. So cover your walk with what you learn in the Word of God. Get your walk right. Put your face in the book. And then you'll be able to fly. You got two to fly. So with twain, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they did fly. Seraphims are another one of the Lord's creations. And these aren't to be confused with cherubims in Ezekiel 1 and 10. Because they got four wings, not six. And they're not to be confused with angels who aren't said to have wings at all in the Bible but look like regular men even though they can fly like Gabriel flew swiftly in the book of Daniel but it doesn't say they have wings. They look just like regular men. That's how you can entertain them unawares. You don't even know that they're angels because they just look like men. The seraphims are something different than cherubims. The seraphims are something different than angels entirely. And they match what John saw in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation 4, 6 through 8, like I said, John has a similar experience where he's caught up into the third heaven. And in Revelation 4, 6, he says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So, you got these four beasts here, they got six wings, just like the seraphim in Isaiah 6. And they're saying the same thing. Holy, holy, holy. They're saying the same things that the seraphim were in Isaiah 6. And I know that pretty much everybody in heaven is going to be saying that same phrase. But still, the Bible is written in such a way where you link phrases and you link words. And it gets you to a conclusion about what a thing actually is. If Isaiah 6 has the seraphim with six wings around God's throne saying holy 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 and then you come to revelation 4 and you got these four beasts with six wings 
saying the same phrase, <coughs> that's putting you to the same conclusion there. So they're very similar to the cherubim, but the cherubim have four wings. And they also have a different name. So it makes sense to say they are a different class of creature entirely. However, I, I don't argue with those who say the seraphim and cherubim are the same. But back to Isaiah 6, 3, it says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice they say the same thing as those four beasts in Revelation 4. Holy, 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 three times. They say it three times because he is holy in the Father, holy in the Son, holy in the Holy Ghost. You got your Godhead, God the Father, the Son, which is the Word, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And that's your Godhead. That's what people refer to as the Trinity. A lot of controversy around that. 1 John 5, 7. This is as far as I take it. I don't get controversial with it. This is as far as I take it. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. We don't believe that there's three gods. We believe that there are three that bear record in heaven. These three are one. That's as far as I take it. And when people begin to argue about it, just let them say what they want to say. And just say, this is as far as I take it. For there are three that bear record. These three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Isaiah said, the whole earth is full of His glory. How so? Because you can look around and see all the things He created. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth wisdom. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Then you go to Romans 1, 19 through 21. It says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. How has God shown himself to us? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They can look around and see that there's a God, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So the earth is full of his glory, but the world doesn't want to give him the glory. They give their glory to something else, at least until the millennium, where the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Then he's going to get all the glory. Isaiah 6, 4. Now these seraphim are up there, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. And the vibration of their voice makes the doors move. Isaiah 6, 4. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. When that seraphim cried out, the posts of the door moved. And this shows heaven is a physical place with physical stuff. Just like hell has gates and bars, heaven has a door. And in Revelation 4, John went through that door. But these seraphims, they're giving praise to God. And it says, and one, in Isaiah 6, 3, it says, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So one cried unto another. One of the seraphims is saying to another. Another way you can be like a seraphim is to admonish one another. Just like the, he talks about, Paul talks about admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In Colossians 3.16, it, said, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So just like this seraphim cried unto another, you admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So when that, when that seraphim did that, the, the posts of the door moved. And there's a, a door, there's doors up there. John went through the door in Revelation 4. When Enoch was raptured, he went through that door. When we get raptured, we'll go through that door. And in Revelation 19, those doors open again and we come back down with the Lord. And Isaiah saw the whole house filled with smoke. This could be where you get the saying, holy smokes. You see, all the common sayings come from the Bible. Second Samuel 22, 9, talking about the Lord, says there went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. And the devil likes to copy the Lord, of course. And he's in Job 41, 20, out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. However, neither of them are just blowing smoke because... You know, we're no match for Satan, but Satan's no match for the Savior. And Isaiah saw and shows that when you get around someone who is holy, 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 you find out you are filthy, filthy, filthy. Look what he says. <coughs> In Isaiah 6, 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He said, woe is me. Like you might say, I hate to add to your woes. This means he's in sorrow and distress because facing the Holy One that inhabiteth eternity, he can see he is undone. Before me and you got saved, we were undone. We had to believe on the one who said it is finished. So that we could be complete in him. We were undone. The Lord says it is finished. We believe on him. We get complete in him. Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him. Which is the head of all principality and power. Isaiah admitted he is a man of unclean lips. This shows an unclean heart. If you have unclean lips you got an unclean heart. But at the same time he has a repentant heart. Matthew 12, 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you got unclean lips, an unclean mouth, you got an unclean heart. At the same time, he's re got a repentant heart. And we all need to admit that our flesh is wicked and that the only righteousness we have is the Lord Jesus. When the Lord sees me, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. But I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Just like Paul says in Romans, he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Peter said in Luke 5, 8, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, they're admitting their sinfulness, admitting they're not worthy to even be around the king. Luke 18, 13, the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what we need, is mercy and more mercy and more mercy every day. And I deserve every bad thing that comes my way because of my flesh, not because of my new man that's in me. My new man in me is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to my flesh, I deserve every trouble and hardship that comes my way. Isaiah 6, 5, Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. His eyes saw the King, and he realized he was a sinner. He saw the living word. And we, when we see the written word, you know, we don't, we don't see the living word. Isaiah saw the living word and realized he was undone, unclean. He said, woe is me. 
when me and you see the written word, our sin becomes exceeding sinful. We say, woe is me. I am undone. I've got unclean lips. Romans seven twelve through 13. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. You see, it's holy, holy, holy. And, and Paul says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that, might, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment, there's the word, might become exceeding sinful. When you open up the book that's holy, 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 the written word, you see yourself and your sin is exceeding sinful, and your flesh is exceeding sinful. You realize your flesh has got problems. Isaiah called himself unclean and the people unclean when he seen who was holy, holy, holy. And it takes one to know one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, I, I'm unclean and the people's unclean. It takes one to know one. When I said you need to be saved, you can take it personal. You can. But just remember, I needed to be saved too. There's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, Solomon said. And then Isaiah 6, 6, it says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Now imagine being Isaiah, and you see one of these seraphims flying at you, and I doubt he stuck his arm out for it to land on his arm. His arm ain't big enough like the Lord's arm. The Lord can probably perch on the seraphims on this arm and all the cherubims on the other arm. Psalm 136, 12, with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. But this seraphim flew toward Isaiah with a live coal in his hand, and that means the coal is burning, and it makes sense because seraphim means burning ones. And it's funny how the seraphim used tongs to take it off the altar. The seraphim didn't touch it, probably showing how, you know, how sanctified it is. But tongs are those things you probably, you know, you, you know what they are. You use them for your spaghetti and stuff. But this one would be bigger and stronger like a smith's tongue that he would use for like getting hot metal and stuff. And Isaiah 6, 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah had to get his iniquity taken care of before he preached. In the Old Testament, it took a burning to purge. Now we are purged by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 9.14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You're purged by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to salvation, my sins have been purged by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my expiation. When it comes to my daily sanctification, I need to purge myself from wicked stuff so I can be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work, just like Paul talks about. But notice he laid the live coal on his mouth, the same place where he said he was unclean. So he laid it on his mouth. And it's interesting that the word that it takes for a person to believe on Jesus Christ is in his mouth, and his heart, Romans 10, 8 through 10. You get that word in your heart, you heard the gospel, it's in your heart, and it's in your mouth. That's how close you are to being saved if you're not. The word's already in your heart, and it's already in your mouth. Isaiah 6, 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Notice the Lord is asking who will do something for him. Wouldn't be an honor, wouldn't it be an honor to answer the Lord and say that you will go? The Lord himself said, who will go for us? There's that Godhead again. There's the Godhead showing up. Kind of like what happened in Genesis 1 when he said, and God said, in verse 26, John, or Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image. Our, us, 
plural, wor plural words showing the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost speaking. Isaiah answers the call to go for the Lord and says, Here am I, send me. He becomes the postman for the Lord. He's the messenger with the Lord's extremely negative message. In Isaiah 6, 9, it says, And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Isaiah is going to have a really negative, hard ministry because Israel has rejected so much truth that they could no longer understand truth if it smacked them in the face from the burning lips of Isaiah. They're not going to even understand the message, so they're going to be blind to it just like lost people are today, just like Israel is today, blind in part. And in 1 Corinthians 2.14, you know what it says? It says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, you can't just understand the things of God, the things of the Spirit of God, naturally. The Holy Spirit has to open it to you. And when you reject truth, the Holy Spirit will get to a point where he doesn't open it up to you. In Isaiah 6.10, it says, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. You see, if the heart is fat, it's hard to prick it with preaching. If the ears are heavy, like they get when you put your head in the pool the wrong way, you can't hear. If you're walking around with your eyes shut, you can't see. So they can't see, they can't hear, they, they can't get their heart pricked, because Israel has turned into the idols that they worshipped. And you know what it says about idols. Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They, now here's the key, they that make them are likened to them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. So you see, they turn into their idols. You are, you're going to be more like what you worship, what you pray to, what you think about. You're going to be more like that. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If all your communications uh, involve your idols, you're going to be just like them. And under the preaching of Jesus Christ himself, they rejected the truth. So he began to pound them with the truth. You see, the truth is going to make an effect, whether it's for better or for worse. The truth is going to have an effect. If you reject the truth, the truth is going to affect you in a bad way. You're going to not be able to understand it. If you receive the truth, you're just going to, it's going to help you so much and you're going to get more and more truth. And just like Jesus said in Matthew 13, 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. That's why he started speaking to them in parables. Isaiah 6, 11 through 12, Then said I, Lord, how long? You know, how long am I going to have to preach this negative message like this? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant. You know, until there's nobody left there to preach to. And the houses without man, you can't go door to door anymore preaching it because there's not going to be nobody there. And the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. So Isaiah wants to know how long is he going to have to preach this negative message. Well, they're not ever going to receive it, so that's his whole ministry. The blindness of Israel goes all the way through the tribulation time period. But then a remnant will see the catastrophic events during that time. They'll see that abomination of desolation where the Antichrist claims to be God. And they're going to believe and they're going to be a faithful remnant during that time. In Isaiah 6, 13, it says, But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a till tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof so he said in it shall be a tenth that's the faithful remnant this is the holy seed prophetically the remnant will 
repopulate the entire nation after Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. You see, and he mentioned the oak. The oak, you find that many times in a negative way in the Bible, and here it shows up in verse 13 of all verses. But the you see the oak, it loses all of its leaves, but then quickly comes back with new ones to replace the old ones. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to lose a lot, but quickly come back to replace the old ones. Just remember a couple of studies ago, seven women shall take hold of one man. They're going to lose a lot of men. They're like in wars and stuff, all the things that happen in the tribulation. Now notice, some shall be eaten, it says. But it, yet in it shall be a tent, and it shall return and shall be eaten. And you could possibly take this literal if you compare other verses, like in Psalm 14, 4. It says, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord. Micah 3, 3, Who also eat the flesh of my people, and flay their skin from off them, and, and they break their bones, and chop them in pieces as for the pot, and as flesh within the cauldron. You see, if the Antichrist goes and sits in the temple and claims to be God, what type of sacrifices will they bring? Probably the Jewish people. The Antichrist will probably have priests for his false religion, and possi they'll possibly eat the leftovers of those sacrifices. You see, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many is going to wax cold. And you see, evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. I mean, they're pretty bad now, but it's going to be worse then. You're already seeing things that are used that are, you know, that used to be detestable are now considered sweet and promoted to children. And if we are to allow certain things, because you know, man can't help how he feels and what he's attracted to, then the envelope will continue to be pushed until, well, he can't help it he likes incest. He can't help it he likes bestiality. He can't help it he likes murder, rape, and cannibalism. And those just become more letters attached on to LGBT. And who will be uh, the people used for the sexual slavery? You see, when that stuff becomes acceptable, who's going to be used to be the sexual slaves that have to be cannibalized? and murder raped you see well it's got to be those good righteous people who the world is going to call evil and they'll take away the righteousness from the righteous men and make them look like the bad guys and make them look evil and detestable so then man will have no problem doing whatever he wants to do to these righteous men and women whether that be cannibalism murder rape whatnot and you see, for these atrocious acts like cannibalism, murder, rape, and things to take place in a world that says love is love, you have to have people who the world absolutely detests for them to have people to practice these horrible acts on. That, that way, in their eyes, it won't contradict their love everything and everybody philosophy and all that. But you see, a lot of their trouble will leave out in the rapture. You see, all the Christians are going to leave out in the rapture. And just when they thought they got rid of all the Christians, a remnant will get right with the Lord in the tribulation. And there will be execution of these people who won't conform. And these people who won't worship the Antichrist because they exclusively worship the Lord God and even trying to proselyte others. That's who they're going to want to get rid of. That's who's going to be eaten. That's the faithful remnant.